those who know you, Mark, know that you are a writing machine. And in addition to your work with the Wall Street Journal, you've written a bunch of books in the past 15 years. Most people, maybe the jazz world, don't know about some of them. Let's talk a little bit about your books. Uh, the first book I wrote was written almost at gunpoint, and the person who was holding the pistol was Nat Hentoff. Nat Hentoff used to call me almost daily and because of jazz wax. And he would hear from other people, hey, did you read this jazz wax thing? You know, and he would then call me and tell me somebody had told him about it. Nat, of course, was famous for, you know, he'd leave a message, leave a long message. You'd call him back. You'd talk. But you'd never get a goodbye from that. It was just the phone would just suddenly hang up. That, but that it wasn't it wasn't a mean or nasty thing. That was just Nat, you know, moving on. Um, so Nat what, called me one day and he said, you've got to write a book. You've got to write a jazz book. You've got to write something. And I said, well, actually, I've got an idea. And I ran the idea by him, which primarily was that there were basically eight categories of jazz in the post-war years. And that I believe that everybody else had written it about different jazz musicians suddenly coming on the scene and changing the music. And I said, my thinking on this is, is not so much that you know, Charlie Parker showed up with Dizzy and there was bebop and then Clifford showed up or Leash Konitz showed up or somebody else showed up and the music changed. I said, I believe really firmly that the music changed due to external forces, that if it wasn't for external forces in each of these cases, that bop never would have happened. I mean, bop never would have happened if it weren't for independent records, record labels that were suddenly, it was suddenly possible because of the end of the recording band. You had the rise of the disc jockey because suddenly the disc jockey could play music records on the radio uh, after 1944. And then you also had the rise of the promoter, the jazz promoter who cared about bebop like Norman Grants. It's, it's these external forces that caused the rise of these different forms of music at specific moments in time. And that was like, Okay, I'm calling my my editor at, at University of California Press. I'm telling her that you're calling, that she's got to publish you, um, and you've got to write a book. So anyway, long story short, or actually long story long, what I did there is I simply called her up. I told her what I was thinking. She was write a proposal. I sent the proposal in. The, the board there met, and they approved the idea, and that book became Why Jazz Happened. But I knew I had to write a jazz book if I was going to be taken seriously in the jazz space. Blog was nice and everything, but a book is a little more heavy, and it's just, it's just, it's like you be, it, it's like being able to hit a grand slam, you know. So getting singles and bunting. I'm sorry to use a sports metaphor to those out there who hate sports metaphors, but um, you know, a book is a grand slam. You have to, you know, it doesn't matter how well it does, but a book just gives you um, a greater gravity, uh, uh, more august uh, feel. Anyway, uh, that came out. Terry also said to me on the couch, hey, you know, you've got to be, you know, after I was blogging, he says, this is after three years, he said, you got to write for the Wall Street Journal. He said, I'm writing now as a critic. I just started as a critic and I'm writing an essay for them. Uh, but, you know, you've got to meet my editor. Uh, you got to have lunch with my editor and you've got to be writing for them. You know, whatever you're doing, you have to stop that and you have to start doing this. And I said, yeah, but he goes, I'm not listening to any, I'm not listening to yeah, well. He said, you got to do it. You've got to, you know, you have to do it. I know you have to do it. You have to do it. <clears throat> anyway, long story short, I, you know, met with uh, Terry's editor. Uh, the editor asked for a few ideas. I sent one in. The first one that I wrote for the journal was on widows of jazz legends who were keeping their name alive and had started businesses as a result. And I interviewed um, Lori Pepper and I interviewed Louis Belson's uh, widow. And I think it was uh, Sue Mingus as well. Anyway, the piece worked out. And the next thing I know, I was getting sent down to Elvis Week in Memphis to do a piece on Elvis Week. And what started out as a piece that was supposed to be about like almost goofing on it, right? I mean, the whole point was to like go down there and write about all these really strange people who were going down there almost cult-like. 
and what was going on. I went down there and, you know, I remember, I remember calling my editor and saying, it's a different story. And he said, well, well you know, what do you think? And I said, well, it's going to sound strange, but everybody I'm meeting here is from Brooklyn. You know, <laughs> they're not, they're not crazy people. They're lawyers and they're doctors and they're just fans. I mean, they're huge fans, but they're professionals from LA. And, you know, there's sure there's people from the, you know, people from Southern areas here who love Elvis too, but, you know, it, it turned out that a lot of the people who were there were professionals from New York and from major metropolitan areas. And um, that became the next piece. And then from there, it just took, it took off like a rocket. I mean, it just, you know, once, once my editor could see what I was doing and how I approached the story, I then did about 60, what I call at home action interviews uh, for the journal, which were uh, pieces with very high profile, um, famous artists, musicians. Um, but I would go to their home. I would only do these if I was allowed to go to their home. And I always did something action wise for the opener. So when I went to see Jerry Lewis at his home uh, down outside of, uh, it, well, it was across the border in Mississippi, um, I wanted him to teach me how to do those runs on the piano with the thumb that he was famous for. No matter who I went to see, there was an action element. If the reader were me, they would have liked to do it themselves. I, I didn't want that opportunity, um, you know, to be lost. Um, and that was just, you know, that, that was a great series and that, that then moved on. You know, that just, things kept multiplying at the journal and, you know, here I am today. Sorry to eat up all of your tape. I don't have tape. <laughs> <laughs>